Something I mention a lot in this channel is the importance of showing business value in your projects. Otherwise, they count as what I call learning projects instead of showing projects, which is something I talk about in my portfolio do's and don'ts video. And learning projects don't really help you that much in the job hunt. They can actually disadvantage you if they show too much of the self-learn aspects of becoming a data analyst. So in today's video, I want to walk you through the actual README template and structure for how we deliver insights at work and how you can bring these elements to your portfolio projects to make them stand out. It's the same template that I teach the students in my program who often land their first analytics jobs within three months or less without previous analytics experience. And at the end, I have a few unique tips for how to make your portfolio projects really stand out and look like a final deliverable that was created by an experienced data analyst. If you're new here, I'm Christine. I'm a former data director and hiring manager. And last year I founded the Analytics Accelerator program, which takes people on the most lean path to working in data. And a lot of times people come in with portfolio projects that aren't really helping them that much in their job hunt. And so in this channel, I'm going to be sharing a lot more insights about how to actually structure and build these portfolio projects in a way that is going to help you land that first data job once and for all. So first off, I see a lot of portfolios that look something like this, where we have some of the technical skills listed, we talk about the data set, and we talk about the process, and we put this all in a structure that doesn't really stand out. Then there's also projects that look something like this, where there's a lot of colors, there's a lot of functionality, there's a lot of different things going on, but I'm not really sure what I'm actually supposed to do with this information. As a hiring manager or even a potential stakeholder, some of the questions that I'm left with when I see projects like this are, what am I actually supposed to do with this information? How can I, as a non-technical person, understand some of the more technical parts of this process? And also, what's the most important stuff that I actually need to know? And what are the things that I don't really need to know? So there's a few key principles that I want you to keep in mind that I notice really good data analysts are able to embody. The first one is always clarity over complexity and function over fanciness. The second one is always make sure that the so what is just one click away. And the last one is to always consider your degrees of detail. So I'm going to show you what all of that means right now. I'm going to walk through an example of the README structure that uses all three of these principles. My perspective is that you should always just use GitHub to host your portfolio. There isn't really a need to make a really fancy looking website. If you have the time, you can definitely do that. But in my opinion, it's more important to focus on other things. So my recommendation is to use GitHub to show that you know the real data ecosystem. And in each repository, you should have one project and a README page that functions as a cover page for that entire project. And in that readme, you should have a few key sections. The first one is background and overview, where you actually talk about the context of the project and the goals, but you need to speak from the point of view of a data analyst. The second section is to have a data structure overview, where you actually show the structure of the data set so someone knows a bit about the domain that you're working with. The third section is an executive summary. This is something that we do at work all the time because there's a lot of people who are stakeholders who are really busy. They don't have all the time to read through all of our insights. And so this is where we just get right into the juicy stuff and we just tell people what they need to know. And then we do an insights deep dive where we talk about specific parts of that executive summary and break down more specific findings into greater detail. And then the last section is an actual recommendation section where we use what we found, a bit of common sense and a bit of domain knowledge to bring this all together and tell the story of what the next steps are. So I'm going to walk through an example from a student from my last cohort who was working as a housing economics analyst and manager, and then he got a job working as a data analytics manager. And for him, the first section looks like this. We have project background where he said Elis Electronics, established in 2018, is a global e-commerce company that sells popular electronic products worldwide via its website and mobile app. The company has significant amounts of data in its sales, marketing efforts, operational efficiency, product offerings, and loyalty program that has been previously underutilized. And this project thoroughly analyzes and synthesizes this data in order to uncover critical insights that will improve the commercial success. So it's really clear what this general goal is. And then we break down the actual things that we're looking at. Sales trends analysis, product level performance, loyalty program success, and regional comparisons. All along in this overview, we're speaking from the point of view of someone who's actually working at the company. Notice I'm not saying things like, I've always loved tennis. And so because since I was young, I was into the US Open, I wanted to do a project about the US Open. Or because I'm really into fashion, I found a fashion data set and wanted to look at the retail trends over the last few years. I'm not using the first person. I'm actually just telling someone in a professional context what this project is about. And then at the end, we do something here where we actually link out to the technical stuff. And this is an example of what I mean by thinking about degrees of detail, where I'm actually separating out 
the important stuff that someone non-technical would want to know, and then leaving the technical stuff outside so that if someone wanted to dig more into it, they could go to it, but I'm not gonna overwhelm the user or the stakeholder with all that information right now. Then in the data structure section, I always recommend including an ERD or an entity relationship diagram. And that shows the relationship of the tables that you were using so that someone can get a sense for the domain of the data. And so in this case, what's impressive about this is that we have multiple tables that join together just as we would on a real data project. And then the data set also contains columns that are widely applicable across a number of different industries. So we have dates, the element of time, obviously. We have customer demographic information like their region their country, their currency. And then we also have product information. And this is obviously relevant to any company that is selling a digital or a physical product. And so we're not being too niche here, but we're being general enough in that our insights can apply to a number of different kinds of companies. You can create this ERD on Canva the way that some of my students do, or you can also just use an entity relationship diagram platform. Sometimes you have to pay for it. I don't know. It doesn't really take that long either way, but it's something that you can add just to show your understanding of some basic data concepts. And then when it comes to executive summary, this is where we have the juicy stuff. If I was a stakeholder and I wanted to know, just tell me what the important stuff is of this project, this is where I would come to. And this is really simple. It's actually just like a three to four sentence summary about your main findings. And so in this example, we said overview of findings, after peaking in late 2022, the company's sales have continued to decline, bummer. With significant drops in 2022, KPIs have all shown year-over-year -year decreases, order volume, revenue, and AOV. While this decline can be broadly attributed to return to pre-pandemic normalcy, the following sections will explore additional contributing factors and highlight key opportunity areas for improvement. And then again, he links out to the technical stuff separately, but includes a snapshot the high level dashboard so that someone can just get a glimpse of the visualizations that he's using to understand some of these trends. So two things here. Notice that the story is very simple. It's not overcomplicated. It's not really statistically super rigorous. It's just telling someone what happened. What did we actually find? And then the visualization itself is pretty clean. We're not using a lot of different colors. It's actually monochromatic. And we've also highlighted out the most important stuff. So this is where the degrees of detail comes in again, where the main metrics are really big so that someone can just get a glimpse at how those numbers are doing. Then the next section is where we drill into one degree of detail further. So we're looking at sales trends in this case. One of them is that beginning in April 2021, revenue declined on a year over year basis for 21 consecutive months. Revenue hit a company lifetime low in October, with the company earning just over 178K. In the following months, revenue recovered slightly following normal holiday seasonality patterns. Another one is AOV, average order value, saw a one month year over year increase in September, 2022. This can be attributed to an increased share of high cost laptop orders. You can see in this case, our job is kind of as a weather person. We're looking at what the numbers are saying and then we're just reporting it out to people, right? We're not really getting too statistically rigorous here or using advanced analytics techniques. We're just telling the story of what happened. And that is honestly a lot of a data analyst's job is to build the thing, look at the thing and then be like, Okay, this is what the thing is telling us. And so each one of your insights here should have a quantified value, an actual business metric, and a simple story about how this looked in historical months. There's obviously a lot of different kinds of analytics projects that you can do, but this kind of structure of looking at what happened in the past and giving recommendations about what happens next is a pretty classic analytics project that most data analysts will actually do on the job. And then when we do include visualizations in the readme, it's very structured and very straightforward. And so this is a really good one. This is a table that shows year over year trends for sales where you can see not only the absolute values in dollars, but you can see the directional trends about whether it went up or down. And then you can see a graph of how this year over year trend changed over time. So immediately the story sticks out to me that at the end of 2021, there was an inflection point at which certain groups started having a really steep decline in their year over year sales. Now, one of the last sections is the recommendations. And this is pretty much where you need to show the usefulness of the project, AKY, why does it matter that you looked at what you looked at? So let's look at a few of these recommendations. Despite the general sales success of Apple products, iPhone sales has been disappointingly low in terms of revenue in 2022, enhancing marketing efforts to previous Apple product buyers could boost sales. 
So in this case, we identify that there are certain groups that are doing really not that well. And so the recommendation is to refocus on that and see where there's opportunity to grow. Reevaluate Bose SoundSport headphones. As the product has never made up more than 1% of revenue, attempt to sell through the product by implementing bundle offers and flash sales to non-Apple ecosystem loyalty members before discontinuing. So again, it's getting a little bit creative. We're just saying, this is what we noticed. It's doing really badly. This is something that we could explore doing in the future. The reality is you'd probably be on a team where you have someone like a marketing analyst or a product analyst giving you a little bit more context into what's actually realistic and an un a deeper understanding of what's happening with these products. And so your job in the portfolio projects is just show a general understanding of some of the things that you would provide to these other team members to help build these recommendations. So I put this all together. I basically have a readme that functions as a final deliverable for a stakeholder that shows the quality of work and also my data storytelling skills. Now, going back to one of the key principles that I mentioned earlier about everything being just one click away, a lot of times resumes will have a link to a GitHub or a portfolio, and then I need to click like five times to get to the actual meat of the stuff. In this case, I recommend just linking to one repository where if someone clicks on it, they immediately get to a readme that shows your insights and your quality of work. So just pick your best project, link to that one, and make sure that high manager can see that within one click. So I want to leave you guys with a few other ways to stand out. One is to use clean and aesthetic formatting. If we're thinking about the fact that we want our portfolio projects to look like something that we would actually hand as a final deliverable to a stakeholder, it probably wouldn't be in GitHub, sure, but in terms of how everything is packaged together, it should show your attention to detail. And so those are just small things, like if you have graphs, remove the grid lines or choose a different font that is sleek and minimal and really clean. And if you're building a dashboard, don't use all the colors in the rainbow actually use monochromatic color schemes for different sections so that everything looks really cohesive. The second one is to speak in common industry terms. So that includes not only having business metrics and the names of those metrics, but also talk about the other people that you'd be working with. So in that project, you could even say, these insights would be used to help a marketing analyst or a finance analyst as if you were on a team. And then the bonus section that I was talking about is to actually include a caveats and assumptions section. So this actually shows your understanding as a data analyst that the data that we work with is not perfect. I wish that was the case, but there's a lot of challenges with missing data or nonsensical data or not enough data. And so talking about that and including that in a section where you just have a few bullet points about some of the roadblocks that you bumped into working with your data set can really show that you understand the practical realities of working as a data analyst on the day-to-day -day job. So I've actually been wanting to do a portfolio project review video because I know you guys have a lot of questions about your portfolios. So two things. One, if you want me to review your portfolio in a future video, leave a comment with a link to your GitHub or your portfolio website, and I will pick a few and let you know and actually give feedback in a future video. If you also have other portfolio project questions, which I'm sure you do, leave those below and I will totally take those into account when I'm making my next portfolio videos. Okay, that's it for today. I hope you guys found this video helpful. Don't forget to subscribe for more insights about portfolio projects and more, and I will see you soon.